Okay, it's day 17, and as you can see, uh, something is amiss. Um, yesterday, at the conclusion of day 16, I sprayed some 70% isopropanol to try to clear up the black mold problem, and as you can see, um, uh, this plant, which was the tallest, it fell over, and if I try to tip it back, you know, to try to get perpendicular or lean to this side, you know, so you can lean against the other plants, it just kind of twirls around in, you know, the place where the root begins. And this was the original plant that uh, fell down after the first isopropanol spraying, uh, you know, three days before that, around day 13. So what happened is this one has sort of recovered. It's using this little plant here as kind of a stool, but it's gotten onto the glass and it's curving back to the light. Um, so it's recovering. It didn't do too bad that during the second spring, probably just because the whatever damage was done to the root was already done. But um, I'll zoom in on this closer later. But um, you know the root is really thin for this first plant to germinate, and also you know this most successful plant with the large cotyledons, it didn't fall over, but the angle that it's standing in the soil has changed. So uh, some of these smaller plants have sort of fallen over basically. And I think they'll recover if the first plant is any indication. I don't want to touch them at all because I'm afraid it'll break. And this one is just leaning up against glass. As you can see this first plant to germinate has a withered stem, you know, from the base coming up from the root. And the root also looks smaller and slightly less juicy than it did before the isopropanol spraying. So what happened was after I sprayed the uh, copious amounts of isopropanol last night, you know, the plants after a few minutes after I stopped filming just sort of bent over and wilted. Um, and I was kind of shocked at the response. And, you know, I have some possible theories on this, but I think the isopropanol like it does with uh, human skin and whatnot, it can absorb pretty quickly if you're in contact with it. So it might do the same for plants because it's a very small molecule, uh, just three carbons with hydrogens attached and one, you know, OH group in the middle. So it's a very small, you know, volatile molecule that can just get into the plants probably and probably gets in their xylem and phloem you know, the conduits in which they transport water and nutrients up and down the plant from the roots and the leaves and vice versa. Um, so that must change the, you know, chemistry within the capillaries, so to speak, within these little seedlings. And something is happening, um, so it's just causing plants to fall over. You know, at first I thought maybe the isopropanol was lubricating uh, the roots in the soil so under its own weight you know the plants were basically sort of pulling themselves out with a lot you know virtually no friction but I don't think that's the case so so to summarize to summarize the action thus far to date there's nine visible green seedlings and there are three germinating right now that have been germinating for about the past day or so so this is the foliage end of the first seed to germinate with a double seed husk still attached, you know, it's managed to fall onto the side of the bowl, the rim, and gain some support that way, but as you can see there's still the first true leaf is growing nicely, and the shoot apical marrow stem is growing too, and soon it'll probably generate another leaf. So this plant looks like it might be in dire straits due to the shriveling of the base of the stem but I don't know it still seems to be getting plenty of water and the cotyledons will have served their function you know even if they get stuck in the seed for a really long time until the day they die you know this true leaf will have probably towered over everything else and I have a feeling that these honeydew plants will get very large uh, very soon. Can alcohol poison plants? Well, I think the answer is no, in the sense that it doesn't 
kill the plants through toxicity, but it does do something else, and it's very fast acting and fast absorbing through the roots or the base of the stems of these plants, and within minutes it causes mild structural damage. Um, they basically till gently or fall over, and there might be some, you know, mild sounds, cracking sounds when that happens, but the roots still seem to be attached, so I'm going to treat these plants very gingerly over the next few days, and I've watered more today to hopefully dilute any tiny amount of residual isopropanol that's still left. And you know, these plants have a self-cleansing system. Basically, all the fluids will eventually evaporate through their leaves, which is their cotyledons at this point, just because of a transpiration pole so all these plants have a stomata on the underside of their leaves that will open and regulate the evaporation of water so eventually whatever isopropanol is still within their systems should all evaporate so this is the current situation with plant number one at the base and as you can see the stem looks withered right before it touches the root and the root itself doesn't look as robust as it used to be so this plant has survived two isopropanol sprayings but obviously something is happening with isopropanol being absorbed within minutes and causing these plants to fall over I don't understand the mechanism behind this reaction but you know it's just a mystery to me why the stems would shrivel like that but the plants would continue to live and if it shrivels at this point, why wouldn't the isopropanol travel all the way up the plant and do damage elsewhere? I don't understand that. It's day 18 and it looks like many of these plants are going to recover. On day 17 I was really worried because on day 16 many of these plants have fallen over from exposure to 70% isopropanol. So as you can see there was a lot of carnage in the aftermath of the isopropanol spraying on day 16. So on the right we have plant number one and the withered stem has, still hasn't really recovered. The root looks a little funny but I think there's still fluid transport actively going on between the root system and the shoot system. So if we look here, there's a very large cotyledon in plant one that has, uh, it's still attached to the seed husk but it's escaped, it's unfolded and there's another cotyledon which is severely underdeveloped and a true leaf in the middle which is even hairier than the stem itself the cotyledons aren't really fuzzy um, and the shoot apical marrow stem will undoubtedly generate more leaves so on the left hand side we have this plant if we follow that it's in trouble you know this was the one that was just attached by the most threadbare of connections to the soil to its root system but it still seems to be growing I believe it has a good very good chance of making a recovery and it's also starting to grow a true leaf here's the base of the stem where it attaches to the root of the first plant that fell over from the very first isopropanol spraying and you, as you can see you know there's that kickstand uh, that sort of bump that I talked about facing downwards that I didn't know a week or two ago whether you know it was um, going to become a root or a leaf and apparently it's neither it's just sort of a you know maybe some kind of bizarre one-sided kickstand to hold the plant up although it would make more sense in that case to have it be circular so these are the most well-developed cotyledons and in the center you can see a true leaf developing and the shoot apical meristem extending um, this plant used to be straight up, but after the second isopropanol spraying, it fell down like the others. And it's doing quite well. And at the base, you can see some other smaller, newer plants that have unfolded and escaped their seeds. It's kind of a mess because everything fell over, but I believe each and every one of these plants will recover, despite how threadbare the connections are to the roots. It looks ugly now, but eventually they'll reestablish themselves and stand back up. So there are 12 seedlings out of 47 possible in all. Uh, three of them were lost due to molding but this one is one of the last ones to germinate that's uh, 
got foliage and it seems to be doing well. I think it'll break free of the seed husk just because it was so soggy and has stayed soggy all this time. So that all that moisture sort of acts as a lubricating force to help the leaves escape. So once it breaks free it should unfold and develop really nicely. So with regards to root development, mostly this same plant with uh, free cotyledons that grew the biggest. You know it has an extensive root system now. If you look under there it's even more extensive than it was last time. Day 19. First we're going to talk about seedling number one. Its roots seem to be in the same condition as uh, the past two days and as you can see the base of the stem is very thin. It's very threadbare at this point. The plant seems to be hanging on and if you look here, um, you know, it's almost escaped its seed husk. It's not an issue anymore. And there's a nice first true leaf growing. Likewise, if we go the other way with the other plant that's right next to it, going in the other direction, you see this. Um, it's still trapped by the seed husk, but there's a nice new uh, true leaf developing. And, you know, the sh posture of this plant is more upright now it was kind of wilting over the edge of the bowl outside the edge of the bowl so I thought it was gonna die but it seems to be recovering so as long as I don't do anything else like spraying more isopropanol it should be fine so here's yet another example of a seedling that can't escape its seed husk and has its cotyledons rolled up in a big O shape so why is this um, one subscriber Kenneth Cram um, who has a very nice nature channel by the way called Nature Quest. I have a link to it on my main channel page. He said in the comments of my previous video that perhaps it's because of the lack of wind and UV light in this synthetic environment that causes these uh, troubles. Um, I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, UV might help degrade the seed husks every day and I think some supplementing theories might be that without the daily fluctuations in temperature you know between day and night and having the sun bake on these seed husks you can't have that you know contraction and expansion and uh, deterioration combined with the UV light shining on the seed husks to make them break more easily so basically I think we're sort of in agreement that it takes a variety of factors perhaps uh, maybe even condensation overnight in the outdoors to help soften and uh, degrade the seed husks to make them fall off but I think there are several other uh, seedlings that have started to shed their seed husks so it's not a complete um, you know inhibition to development the ideal would be every seedling develops like this one and just has two uninhibited cotyledons that grow bigger and bigger and you know just start developing true leaves which get sunlight immediately instead of being blocked by you know that ring configuration made by an attached seed husk and you know I don't know why this one developed the way it did you know the treatment was the same for all these seedlings so there is some luck involved, I think, in the way the seed husks are built for each particular seed. And, you know, the way it landed in the soil and how long the seeds were just um, incubating in moisture. At this point, all of the established seedlings have their first true leaves growing out. And the first thing you can notice is they're hairier, both on the, the petioles, which are the little stems that connect leaves to the plant, and the leaves themselves than the cotyledons. So the cotyledons are just a pair of you know leaves that look very generic and similar in almost all plants um, you know related to something such as honeydew and they come within the seed uh, they're basically like pre prepackaged you know solar panels to help photosynthesize and get the plant started and create a good root system and and generate new leaves through the shoot apical meristem. So the new leaves that are developing will be what will stay with the plant for the 
remainder of its life. And, you know, sometimes the earlier ones can be shed and the ones higher up on the canopy will remain. But this is a vine, so I'm assuming that the leaves, this leaf at least, will be around for a long time. And, you know, insect predation is a very big problem. So for something large like maybe a beetle, um, this hair defense might be a joke, but for small, tiny first instar caterpillars or uh, say aphids, uh, these little you know, hairs might be very annoying and prevent them from getting their heads close enough to sink their you know, mandibles into the veins of the leaf or to chew on the leaves and eat them. So as you can see from the front of the first true leaf on this plant, it has a lot of vein structure that is quite different from, it's a lot more complex than the two cotyledons, for example. And I can show you more than, on that later on in close-ups, but uh, yeah, I can't, it's not really big enough for me to count the, the vein structure, but it's definitely a shovel-shaped leaf with uh, serrated edges. And I think these will probably grow very, very large, if you can imagine the size of the honeydew fruit. Um, I can just imagine a large thick vine crawling across my uh, living room table and just having these giant shovel shaped leaves probably the size of my hand if not larger. So if you compare that to the vein structure of a cotyledon on the same plant it's quite different. And if you compare that to the underside of this cotyledon you know it's got five veins uh, three of which are more visible and you know the central vein branches into three more veins on the top so it's a very simple design with a, a curved edge and finally we have two seedlings that are struggling to break free of all their entanglements uh, the one I'm focusing on in the center looks to be a very healthy plant that will have a good future um, the other one just needs to break free of all that mass that dirt and seed that's still attached to it, but it's straightening out. You know, after the isopropanol spraying, these kind of fell over and I was really worried about them. So if we count them, there's one, two, three, um, four, and five, six, which is this long one, the very first one, traces to the middle, seven, which is the second one I, I've been showing in these videos lately. 8, the small one, and 9, this one that almost also fell over and uh, was in dire straits after the isopropanol cleaning. Aside from those 9 easily visible seedlings, there are 4 more that are germinating but are very inconspicuous. Here's one that seems to have cotyledons ready and a root system or the very base of the stem that's uh, turning green already. Here's a second one. A third one. Here's a fourth one bringing the total to 13 seeds germinated out of a possible 47. There were originally 50 honeydew seeds, but I threw away three due to molding. So I think this would be a good test site for an application of a very low concentration, you know, diluted spray solution of Lysol. Um, my father says that he has sprayed such a solution on house plants with no ill effects. So I need to go look into that into more detail and see, you know, if that's a good possible solution for the mold problem since I don't want the entire bowl molding over.